What you see behind me may look like something that's just rolled out of the panel beaters, but it's actually an early development vehicle of the original VF Commodore and its recent successor, the VF2. Beneath all of that cladding and stripy paintwork is a development car that Holden's used here at its Lang Lang Proving Ground and later on public roads for final testing. Today we're going to figure out how the car goes from that stage right there to the final locally produced Commodore ever, the VF2. So Amelinda Watt, you're the lead development engineer for the Series 2 VF Commodore and you've been working on Commodores for the past 15 years and Holden's as well. Yep. Could you explain to us why you guys actually put all the swirly lines on these cars and cover them in cladding as well? Okay, so this is one of our early VF prototype cars. We have all the checker paint and the, uh, the camouflage just so people can't see what we're developing. Because these cars really go, I guess the, the hand-built prototypes go into production well before the car's released. You've got a previous car on sale at the time as well. At what point would you guys actually assemble this car and then start testing it? Uh, so we'll build these cars about 18 months before we start production, just to make sure we've got enough time to complete all our testing and get everything just right. Putting all this black cladding on, um, I'm sure would add heat and sort of make this car slightly different to the final product that's released. At what point would you guys actually strip all this back and, and try it without any cladding? And where would you do that? Because you don't want people seeing the car, right? Yeah. Obviously, but yeah, a lot of our testing does require to be done without camouflage, so we can take it off under our secure labs and facilities and of course the proving ground here. This place but, is huge, like yeah. there's, there's a lot of empty space here to do stuff. Yep. Now your baby is actually the VF2 and uh, there's one right behind you, but it looks just like a VF1. I think we need to go check out what's actually different beneath the skin of that car. Sure. Amelinda, this is the car that you've been working on for the past two years. It looks just like a normal VF Commodore. What's actually different under the bonnet? So it allows us to do all our work on the road. It looks like a VF, but we've got all the VF2 running gear in here. So we've got the LS3 powertrain, the uh, 304 kilowatts and 570 newton metres. Gets up and goes. <laughs> it sounds pretty impressive. So what was the target power out of this engine? What did you want to actually achieve? We had to have a number that started with a three. Okay. Yep. <laughs> the numbers with threes are always good. <laughs> and that also means that the zero to 100 figure has also improved. Um, yep. I hear that it's now below five seconds. Is that right? You can do a sub five seconds. We and we've been do. shown that once. It, it can be done. So yes. it's achievable. Yep. Um, so what's this thing right here? It looks like a hose from Bunnings. What exactly does that do? So this is our mechanical sound enhancer, which lets all the low frequency, you know, good V8 rumble into the cabin. So it's piped directly through the firewall into so the cabin. The final piece of the package is this. It's a bimodal exhaust, which the Commodore has never had. And unlike most other cars, it's not pressure driven. How exactly does this work? The valve here is electronically controlled. So it looks at your gear state, your pedal position and your RPM. And we work out when we need to open and shut the valve. So yep. you have lots of V8 character, but at the same time refinement. Because that's the issue with some cars. You've really got to get stuck into it for it to make noise. Whereas yep. this car will make noise a lot of the time. And what about this thing right here? It looks like a manufacturing defect. What, is, what does that actually do? So th this this hole here allows us to push more sound out underneath the car, which lets us put more sound into the car, which lets the driver have you know, that really good V8 experience. Well, that's 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 exactly right. I mean, that, that is the goal with these cars, to yep. make them sound good. Yep. Now, my other question is, what happens with this car when you're done with it? Does it get it's, dressed up and then sold? or No, what? no, unfortunately not. This one goes to the crusher. Seems like a perfectly good waste of a car. But one car that won't be wasted is the new VF2. Production ready. I think we need to go have a look at that and maybe take it for a drive as well. Sure. Amelinda, this is a Commodore Series 2, a production car. Tell me, what exactly does this fascia duct here actually do? Are they functional? Uh, yes, they are. We had to maintain the overall aerodynamic performance of the car, so we've opened up the front grille here to get some more cooling air in, but that creates more drag. So what we've done there is have these fascia ducts in the corners of the fascia here that help the air flow around the corner. They reduce the size of the wake and help improve aero performance. What about this up here? Yep. Does that actually do anything? And sometimes you see sort of heat, heat waves coming out of it. Yep. That means that water can get in there. How That's do you actually right. stop water getting in? I think we've got one here. So, what, what does this mechanism here actually do? A fair bit of engineering work has gone into this. Um, we've got to control the water flow into the engine bay to keep it away from any critical electrical parts. So we have a bath on the bottom mm -hmm. of the hood. We have like a chimney to let the, uh, the air out. And then this bath here then controls the water flow away from any critical components in the engine bay. That's really interesting. But I think what's more interesting is how this car sounds. And I reckon you need to take us for a spin. Sure. So, Amelinda, you've run us through all the technical details, but now we want to hear the car. Can you give it a stab for us? Sure. <laughs> 
<laughs> that noise is so good. Oh my God, have a listen to that. That is absolutely incredible. Far out. That actually sounds like an old school muscle car. How long, how long did it take to actually perfect that and get it right? Did it start out perfect from the beginning or did you have to work no, on it? No, no. We spent a couple of years working on this, you know, first getting the hardware set right and then just continuing to tune and tune and tune until we're sure we had it perfect. Oh, I've got to hear it again. Can we, can we do that once more? Let's do it again. one more time. Oh, it's so uh, perfect. So the sound we're hearing in here is from that sound enhancer sounds, and then outside. We've got the exhaust. Oh man, that is so good. Oh, that is that is sensational. I I am very jealous of your job. Uh, if, if that was me having to do that every day, um, I would never quit. In fact, I'd keep telling them that it was bad so I could keep trying it. <laughs> now, Amelinda, you've worked on all the sound and all the noises, um, but there's another guy that's tuned this car in terms of dynamics, and he's also set a world record at the Nürburgring. So, do you mind if we swap you out with Rob Tribbiani? Sure. So Rob, what is your title and what do you do at Holden? So I'm the lead vehicle dynamics engineer here at Holden. So what does that mean? What exactly does a lead dynamics engineer do? Uh, they get to have the fun. <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, so I basically get to tune the ride and handling of, uh, of Holden vehicles. So you're responsible for the VF Commodore and the way that it rides? Yeah, basically, yeah. So how much effort goes into making these cars ride as nicely as they do? Because I mean, that, that is one of the biggest achievements in an Australian car is the ride and handling. Everyone yeah. says it's the best. Yeah, tuning ride comfort is a huge part of our job and just getting the refinement into the vehicle. Um, it takes you know years of uh, tyre work and damper work, um, selecting the right hardware in the car, springs, and stabiliser bars. So it's a, it's a big effort to, to put it all together. Yep. And how long have you been with Holden and what, was, uh, what are some of the cars that you've worked on in the past? I've been with Holden 19 years now. Wow. Yeah, so <laughs> I've worked basically on every Commodore series since the start of VT. That's pretty impressive. Um, yeah, it's VT very was, I guess, the car that set everything up, right? It was the, the dynamic benchmark, I guess. Yeah, VT was a very successful car for us. It looked fantastic. It drove really well. And then since then, we've had uh, several uh, evolutions of yep. that. And then moving through to VE uh, back in 2006 when we started off with this fantastic architecture. Yep. And uh, yeah, have progressed through the VF and VF2. So one of the other things that you, uh, you've grown accustomed for is your lap of the Nürburgring in a Commodore. Now, was that the most fun you've ever had in a car? That's got to be a career <laughs> highlight, um, for sure. You know, being able to, to take a, a Holden badged vehicle to the Nürburgring, you know, an Australian car in such an iconic car as the U, uh, and play it on the world stage. Uh, and mixing it with the cars that were there, you know, um, some incredible European vehicles. It was it was a fantastic. That is so cool. And how did that come about? Whose idea was it? Who who thought? Oh, this will be a good idea. Yeah, there were a few uh, little murmurs in engineering. We had a car that happened to be in Europe at the time doing uh, testing, yep. and we decided to you know it would be quite an easy task to get the car <laughs> uh, shipped to Germany and uh, send me over. <laughs> I'm sure you didn't have to spend much time thinking about the, the answer to that. No, uh, the response was very quick. Uh, I had been there uh, before testing cars for, for Holden. Yep. And, uh, but yeah, it was the first time that we had been there with the Ute. So yeah, that what an so awesome cool. opportunity. And did it cope well? Did you have any dramas with the Ute? No, the car performed flawlessly. It really uh, handled the road incredibly well. And, uh, and yeah, you know, we learnt a lot being there. It's, it's a different environment. Um, the Nürburgring, what a lot of people don't realise, is there's um, a thousand foot or 300 metres of elevation change. So, you know, there are some very steep climbs and some very steep descents. So, you know, the suspension, cops are, are pounding, there's yep. 120 plus corners. Um, yeah, brakes get a, a hard time. Yeah. You've got to be very precise with the steering. So it was great uh, to work on EPS while we were there yeah. and, and uh, you know, get the car very precise. So yeah, it was a fantastic opportunity. So I guess one of the things that makes the Commodore such a good car is, is the way that it handles. And uh, you do all of your testing out here at the Holden Proving Ground. Is this one of the test tracks you normally drive on? Yeah, so the road we're on at the moment is the ride and handling <laughs> road, and, and it really is exactly that. It's a, the road that we use to tune the ride and the handling of the vehicle. It's a fantastic bit of road. Um, you know, it's really designed to push and pull the car around, yep. and, and uh, it's, yeah, 
our jobs, I guess, to, to get the car to control um, its inputs on this bit of road. And it's representative of an Australian road because it's not perfect and this is, exactly. you know, you don't want to have a perfectly smooth surface because not every road in Australia is perfect. No, that's right. And we've got a very strong correlation between how the vehicle needs to perform on this road yep. to then what that translate to, uh, translates to in the, in the real world on the public road. And with, with a car like this, a ute, traditionally people think of utes as, as cars that don't really handle that well. How is this different from a traditional ute that uses leaf springs? What's, what's the difference in the Commodore? Yeah, the, uh, the Commodore ute runs the same very sophisticated suspension as, uh, as the sedan and, and the wagon. Um, and even the long wheelbase for that matter and uh, it's just different in its uh, spring rate and damper tune but the basic architecture of the suspension is exactly the same yep. so it runs a very sophisticated suspension system we've been able to tune ride comfort into it um, and still maintain excellent handling. Now I've noticed we went over tram tracks there earlier people yep. will know that Melbourne is full of full of tram tracks yes. is, is it a challenge to make a car like this uh, handle handle well sort of when you're pushing it, uh, drive well on B roads and also drive well through the city as well. Yeah, the ute is probably the biggest challenge because um, you know it's a complex beast. People use it as a two-seater sports car, uh, they use it as a workhorse, they use it to tow the boat. <laughs> um, so getting you know getting all of those um, requirements into the car, it's it's a challenge. Uh, we spend a lot of time tuning the car in varying uh, load cases, yep. so we run the car uh, empty and then obviously you know, work our way through to, to maximum yep. payload. So the road that we're on right now is literally throwing the car about everywhere. This is like the worst road I've ever seen. Um, how many times would you pass over something like this to actually get that tuning perfect? Thousands. <laughs> yeah, I've driven this road thousands of times in tuning the VF2. Um, it's, it is a you know, very challenging road, as you mentioned, uh, with lots of inputs. And uh, yeah, we, we work on dampers and, and tyres to, to get the car perfectly balanced. And what's your background? What kind of an engineer are you? I'm a mechanical engineer, yep. Yep, uh, qualified. So. And if people want to, to do this type of stuff and get into the automotive game, what do they need to do? Yeah, uh, start off with an engineering degree and just have a real passion for cars. Yep, fantastic. Thanks so much for your time, Rob. Not a problem.